Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Kelly. I am the program coordinator with the Rochester Hills Public Library. Uh, and I would like to welcome you to tonight's program, uh, Monsters of the Great Lakes, uh, presented by Sheetan Noir. Uh, our next program will be coming up on Tuesday, uh, the October 19th, and that is Wildlife and People of Africa in the Falkland Islands. Uh, that'll be presented by veterinarian and wildlife photographer Carl Palazzolo. Uh, and you can register for that at calendar.rhbl.org. That is an in-person program. Uh, if you're interested in attending, just uh, so you know, but you can register again at calendar.rhbl.org. Uh, for tonight's program, the audience will remain muted throughout the duration of the program. Uh, and if you, uh, we will have a Q&A afterwards, however. Uh, and if you want to ask questions, then you can ask them in the chat feature, and I will present them uh, to our speaker as a moderator. Uh, and the program tonight is also being recorded. It will be available in about one week on RHPL's website and on our YouTube page, so you can share with any friends or family who weren't able to make it out tonight. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library, uh, Thanks to them and their support and all their wonderful fundraising efforts, we can present awesome shows uh, and programs to you like the one we are about to be a part of tonight. And with all of that said, I'd like to start uh, this program and welcome you to tonight's presenter, Sheetan Noir. Sheetan, take it away. Hi, everyone, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. I hope you find our subject matter tonight interesting. Um, I'm very passionate about lake monsters, and it's one of the things I enjoy talking the most about. But a little background on me. I am a Michigan-based author who has written two books, um, Lake Monsters of the Great Lakes and Mothman and Other Fine Creatures of the Midwest. Those are available on Amazon, but I am also the lead writer for a magazine publishing company called Squatch GQ. Um, we also have a title called Squatch Digest, uh, Watchers Magazine, which is UFOs and Extraterrestrials, G Hunter Magazine, which is Ghost Hunting, Haunted Locations, The Paranormal, um, a magazine called Dinosauria that focuses on dinosaurs and prehistoric creatures of the Great Lakes or um, of uh, prehistoric creatures. Um, and we also have a magazine coming out in 2020 called Weird Travels, where I go around to different locations um, to see if the claims um, and the information that's on the internet is actually accurate and what people can expect when they visit these sites and if it's safe to go there or are you better off just going to another location. So um, those are the publications that I write for. I am also the lead investigator for the Michigan chapter of the North American Dogman Project. I also teach at two different community colleges, including uh, Kellogg Community College in uh, Battle Creek and Hastings, and down in Ohio at in Perrysburg at the um, Owens Community College. The two courses that I teach at those locations are the Paranormal History of the Great Lakes and Cryptozoology of North America. Um, so if you're interested in either of those and you're um, close to Toledo or over the Battle Creek area. Um, I offer those courses in the spring and the fall. So um, we're just getting past uh, the, um, the, the class for Kellogg Community College just finished, but I do have openings at the Ohio um, location for paranormal history of the Great Lakes. Um, again, that's at Owens Community College. So on to tonight's subject which is Lake Monsters of the Great Lakes. Now, when I'm talking about Lake Monsters of the Great Lakes, I divide it up, you know, when I'm doing research and I'm taking reports, I have six different categories that these creatures go into. The first one would be giant fish and then giant turtles, uh, sea serpents, amalgamations, which is a bunch of different, you know, details uh, from different animals you know, put into one creature. And then the sixth category would be uh, the merfolk. Um, and we do have a, a, a merman 
um, type creature uh, legend in Lake Superior. So we're going to start with the giant fish. Now, according to Native American legend, in Lake Superior, there lives a giant sturgeon. And this sturgeon is so powerful and so big that he has been known to dent the hulls of ships um, back in the era of the wooden uh, steamers and schooners. And a lot of old maritime sailors would talk about this creature. And we do know of at least one case where a wooden steamer was trying to get into port. And at one point, um, they had just come through a storm and part of the um, phenomenon of the giant fish is said to be that these are giant lake sturgeons. And when they whip their tails back and forth, it creates these huge waves on Lake Superior. So they had just gotten through a, a storm with very high waves and were uh, slowly pacing along, um, trying to get back into to port when all of a sudden their ship hit something so hard that it released their anchor chains from both the front of the boat and the back of the boat, dropping them into the water. Um, and it, it did this with such force that um, when they, you know, when they tried to crank the, the anchors and the chains back up, um, they found that it had done damage to the chain releases. So this was a very long and hard process requiring most of the men on the ship to crank these you know, anchor chains back up so that they could just get back into port. Now, once they did get back into the port, um, the captain, knowing that hull of the ship had to be dented somewhere um, underneath the water, he hired a um, underwater um, a diver to go down and see what the damage was and you know how, how you know how it would be to fix this the diver wasn't down very long when he suddenly resurfaced and he said I don't know what you hit but you have a massive dent in the hole of your ship and it's going to take a couple of weeks to repair now some people might say that they hit a sandbar um unmarked sandbar or a rock formation that, you know, nobody knew about, maybe even a, a, a tree that was, you know, floating through the water. But a lot of old maritime sailors will say, nope, you hit the giant lake sturgeon that lives in Lake Superior. So that is our, our biggest or our most well-known story of giant fish here in the Great Lakes. Now, the next category, the giant turtles, we find two different cases in the Lake Michigan area along the Michigan coastline. So the first one is in Stearns Bayou, um, which is about middle of the state, maybe a little bit higher, um, certainly a little bit higher than um, Grand Haven, but I would say between Grand Haven and Ludington area. And so the legend of the Stearns Bayou turtle is that on the first occasion, a now this happened in the early 1800s, and at this time period, it was very well known that more well-to-do families, any families that had wealth during the summertime, they would rent co um, cottages along the different lake shores because it was much cooler. You got that nice breeze coming in off of you know the Great Lakes, uh, much better atmosphere, cooler in the summertime than let's say your inner cities like Detroit, Lansing, Flint, um, you know, even Chicago. So a lot of families who had just a little bit of wealth or more wealth would rent these cabins or have a summertime home that was along the lake shores where they could get the cooler atmosphere coming in off of the lake. So on this occasion, there was a doctor and his family staying at the cabin and because it had been so very, very hot that day, most of them were sitting out on the porch of the cottage and enjoying the cool breeze that was coming in off of the waterfront and the bayou. Now, it wasn't too long before they started hearing a huge ruckus coming up the waterway um, towards the cabin. And at first they thought maybe it was people canoeing, but it didn't quite sound like that. Then they thought, you know, maybe it's a bunch of spawning fish, but mm, that didn't seem to fit the bill either. So eventually they noticed a glowing object coming up the water 
towards you know where they are. Now their their cottage actually sat on the side of the waterway, a certain bayou, and so they were observing this glowing object coming closer to them. Now they said that this object was huge, um, and the measurements of this creature would have rivaled that of a Volkswagen bug of today's time and date. So they they witnessed this creature swimming past and observed that it was very turtle-like. And as it got near the cabin, it seemed to notice them. So at this point, it kind of submerges under the water. It's still glowing, it's bioluminescent, and it moves past. So they are awestruck at this um, creature because certainly they've never heard of a turtle that glows or is bioluminescent and produces its own light source. Um, they've also never heard of a turtle quite this big before. Now, we do know in the fossil records that there was a turtle, an aquatic turtle, um, named Arquan that measured 15 feet from nose to tip of tail and 13 feet from the tip of the left flipper to the tip of the right flipper. So a very, very big turtle. Now, we don't know if uh, this was an Arquan that had survived and had, you know, set up a breeding colony here in the Great Lakes. All we do know is that this wasn't the first time that this creature was witnessed. A couple of weeks later, the same family who are there again, um, relaxing along the beach side, uh, they spend all day and then towards night, um, everybody goes into the cottage but about 2.30 in the morning, the dad gets up because it's insufferably hot in the house, the cottage, and he goes out on the front porch and he's sitting there uh, just trying to cool off and relax. And at this time, he hears the same sound of something swimming up the water channel. And he's all alert because he knows that this is that weird turtle that they saw. And he's wondering if he can get a better glimpse. So... As it would happen, there was a sandy beach across the waterway from the cottage, and this is where the turtle comes up out of the water. And he makes a mental note of where the turtle you know, goes, and it seems to be laying eggs. So he observes it for a very long time as it's doing this process. And he waits a, you know, a good hour or so after the turtle goes back in the water because he's thinking, you know, I don't know if she just came back down the beach and went into the water and sank and is waiting for a predator to come try to steal her egg. So he waited till it was light and some of the other family members were up and he said, we need to go across into the sand because uh, the turtle came back and it laid an egg up there. So they, they carefully get into a rowboat. They will across the waterway, get up onto the sand beach. They do find where she laid her egg and they observe that there is one egg in the nest, and it's about the size of a medium-sized pumpkin, very leathery texture to the egg, and but a very gelatinous type um, consistency. Um, certainly not a solid egg, but not watery either. So they were able to lift the egg up, put it in a, in a blanket, and hold on to the blanket as they, you know, came back across in the boat. Now, that evening, there was an ice cream social in the town. So they all decided the proper thing to do would be to take the egg into town and see if any of the local people could recognize what kind of an egg it was, you know, tell them what kind of turtle it was. And then they, you know presumed that maybe they might take it back and put it back into the ground where the turtle had laid it, or maybe somebody would like to buy it from them and maybe they might get, you know, some money for it. So that evening, everybody loads up onto, you know, the wagon and it's a horse, you know, pulled wagon. So as they're getting near the town, they have to pass a wooden bridge. And as it is, the bridge, it, it's solid, but it's kind of rickety in the fact that there's bumps in it. And as the wooden uh, wagon is going across it, the gentleman whose job it was to hold on to the egg, he's sitting on the side of the wagon, uh, kind of like kids will do with a hay wagon. And as they hit a big bump, um, the 
egg kind of um, doesn't explode, but it, it pops loose from his arms and falls into the river below. And even though people go to search for it, they never find the egg again. So we don't really know if this was the last generation of that species of turtle or if the breeding female found a better location to lay her eggs, uh, one of void of humans. Uh, but we certainly know that this egg that she produced on this occasion was lost and they were never able to determine what species of tur turtle it was. Um, it was described as being yellow with purple spots, a hippopotamus type head, a alligator-like tail, but looking more like a soft-shelled turtle and being of immense proportions and being bioluminescent. So um, we do have soft-shelled turtles here in Michigan, but as far as I know, none of them provide their own light source. And uh, none of them that I have witnessed are the size of a Volkswagen bug. Uh, Semi-truck tire, yes, Volkswagen bug, no. So our next giant turtle story comes from Lake Lelanau up in the um, area of Lelanau, which is in between Traverse City and the Ludington area. Now it's said that Lake Lelanau is a man-created lake and it has these trees in it that I refer to as zombie trees. And if you're ever driving by um, one of these, you'll you will recognize it because it's a deep, you know, pond or lake that has been filled. But they don't bother pulling out the trees, so the tree, the trees eventually take on this gray appearance, and they don't produce leaves anymore. They just stick up out of the water, and they they look like zombie trees. Um, so on this occasion in Lake Leelanau, a young man decided he was going to go out perch fishing. And so he had a rowboat, he had his fishing pole. He rows out to where he thinks is a good location to find perch in the lake. And he comes close to one of these zombie trees and he doesn't have an anchor. So he decides he's going to tie his boat to this tree so that in case he hooks a big perch or a big fish or something like that, um, it's not going to pull him all over the lake in his, his rowboat. He'll be, you know, he'll be attached to something. That way he can have, you know, something to brace against if he's reeling in this uh, big fish. So as he's getting his rope and he's tying, you know, he's starting to put the rope around the tree and he hasn't quite tied the knot yet. His rowboat is gently butting up against what he assumes are the roots of the trees, um, you know, close to the zombie tree. That is until a large head and neck raises up out of the water and looks him in the face. And it's at this point that he realizes that this tree is actually sitting on the back of a very large turtle. And so he pulls the rope free and falls back into the rowboat. And it said he starts paddling one way and the turtle starts swimming off another way. And he decides that, you know what? I don't think I ever want to go fishing in that lake again because I don't know exactly which one of those zombie trees is attached to a giant turtle. And I don't really want to know what the giant turtle can do if it's bad. So there is our second uh, turtle, giant turtle story uh, from Lake Lelanau on the Lake Michigan um, area. So our next category is sea serpents. And sea ser serpents are exactly what it sounds like. It is a serpentine creature. <laughs> that swims through the water in an undulating manner. And some people might say these are logs, but a lot of the reports you know, that people made, um, the creatures are anywhere from eight feet long to 80 feet long, black, gray, green, or purple in color. Um, there are lots of reports from the Lake Huron area of these ser sea serpents, but the best um, and most well-documented case of sea serpents is actually up from the Mackinac Straits area where local um, uh, visitors to um, 
the area right there on the coast, we're observing these different um, creatures swimming and playing in the water. Um, several phone calls were made to the local authorities and a sheriff's deputy did come out and he decided he wanted a better look at what these creatures were so he could make a better you know, report on them. So he, he secures a watercraft. I'm assuming it was a rowboat. It might have been a motorboat because every time he would get within 20 feet of the creatures, they would dive underwater and swim off to another location. And this only happened three times before the creatures uh, finally left the area. And he was actually never able to get close enough to make a report of what exactly they were. He wasn't sure if it was a, like a sea lamprey, you know, one of these big um, sucker mouth fish that um, attaches to things, if it was lake sturgeons, if it was salmon, or if it was a sea serpent monster um, that Lake Huron is known for. So um, this report was in the 70s. And uh, so we do know that this brave deputy went out onto the water to try to confirm what exactly these creatures were. Unfortunately, he was not successful in it, and he could never quite get co close enough to these creatures to uh, decide what exactly they were and, you know, uh, put that in his police report. So for, for our lakes, uh, you know, Huron sea serpents, um, there are many from, you know, um, all over the lake, but that is the most notable story of the sea serpents. So our next category is the amalgamations. And there's four different ones that I like to talk about in my presentations. And these amalgamations are, um, they're, they're kind of territorial to the lake that they reside in the only one, the only lake that doesn't really have one is Lake Michigan. But we're going to start um, to the east and we're going to start with Lake Ontario. Now, Lake Ontario has a, um, a amalgamation that is called O'Nair. Now, there's two different descriptions of O'Nair. One is that it almost looks like an Asian oriental dragon. And if it, it, you know, comes flying through when the mist and the fog starts rolling in and people think that it's, it's trying to warn you to get off the lake. Um, certainly it means that storms are coming and a storm front is coming through and that you should probably get off the lake um, as quickly as possible because O'Neill is sounding his signal. The second description of O'Neill is this wolf-headed um, wind-type entity. And it's said that its screams are scary enough, but when people see o uh, this version of Onir, it's almost always a signal that a gale is coming and with it usually a blizzard, usually a very bad winter storm. And um, winter storms on the Great Lakes, gales are not to be taken lightly because they have sent many ships to the bottom of the lakes and cost many lives. So people are always on the lookout for O'Neill, either in the Asian dragon form or the scarier wolf type form. Um, you know, as they they come whistling through the lakes and uh, maybe bringing storms with them, maybe warning of the storms, but generally when the fog starts coming across the lake surfaces and the winds start picking up, that is when local, uh, you know, Native American tribes say, you will see O'Neill and uh, be able to witness him. Now, the next creature, he kind of goes between Lake um, Erie and Lake Ontario, and he's part of a Seneca legend. Seneca uh, Native American uh, Indian tribes. And uh, this creature is a meteor dragon. Um, that's how it's best described. It said that it's blue, um, you know, it's, it's orange with blue flames around it and it can um, float across the surface of the water, dive underneath the water, come back up fully, you know, uh, engulfed in flames. And it can, you know, do this at, at you know, 
at its own will. And the name of this creature is Gassendia, which is a very long uh, spelled word. And uh, taking a stab at the pronunciation for it, um, I, I talked to uh, a uh, language specialist for the Ojibwe tribe, and I was asking him how you would pronounce um, the name of uh, Gassendia. And he said, you know, you should really go ask the Seneca because that's not one of our spellings. And I said, oh, I don't know anybody of the Seneca tribes um, that well to ask them, you know, how to pronounce this. Uh, I just lucked out finding you. And he said, well, here are a few keys with how you pronounce Native American languages um, and words because our, our language was a spoken oral language for generations, hundreds of generations before white settlers came over and introduced us to the alphabet. And then we're trying to help us spell out our words, spell out our names for things. And so it was just as much of a, of a, um, you know, learning experience for them as it was for us. And you get these weird names that have a lot of syllables in them, a lot of vowels, and you can just kind of have to sound it out. He said, but usually you leave off the first uh, uh, so, you know, syllable, the first letter, and then it's you know every few other. And I said, okay, that does not give me a very um, smooth off the tongue pronouncing word. Um, at that point, I would have been pronouncing the name of this creature as N the A. Uh. And I said, I don't think that will go very well with doing presentations. He said, you know, you're probably right on that one. <laughs> Sorry, my throat start, starts getting dried out. So he said, keep the G on the end of it and just pronounce it yes and yeah. And I said, that sounds wonderful. So the Native American Seneca tribe had reported this creature for many, many generations and knew of it. They, they um, you know, knew what it looked like and had, you know, told other people about it. And it wasn't really taken seriously until the French fur trader and explorer Jacques Cartier was in the area and happened to witness this creature flying across the water, diving into the water, then coming back up, and it was still engulfed in flames. And at this point, he's questioning what he's seeing. So he talks to the local Native American tribes who happen to be Seneca, and he, said, he describes the creature to him and what it did. And he said, what is this? And they said, oh, you have witnessed the, the meteor dragon or um, you know the, the Lake Erie dragon, and its name is Cassendia. So now we have the legend of Cassendia. Um, that is part of Seneca legend. So the next amalgamation I'm going to talk about is a creature called Carcagna. Now he is um, said to have been a huge troublemaker in Georgian Bay, um, which is on the Ontario side of Lake Huron. And legend goes that um, Carcagna, he was swimming in and out of local fishing ports, destroying fishermen's boats and nets and traps, and just wreaking all kinds of havoc. And it said that everybody was terrified of Carcagna. So this begins a, um, a tale um, of Mike Finn. Now, Mike Finn was a tall tale character, kind of like Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox, Johnny Appleseed, John Henry, um, American folklore. And so Mike Finn was actually here in the Great Lakes area. And it said that on you know one particular night, Mike Finn was in the local tavern and he's bragging and telling you know his tales of accomplishments about how he took down a, a full grown moose by the horns on its head and taught it a lesson and he knocked one man out with a punch and he's wrestled a bear and, and there's really nothing that uh, living breathing that stands a chance against him because he'll just whip its butt and, and that'll be that. So he's going on and on and uh, everybody's, you know, always uh, interested in hearing Mike Finn's tales. 
But then a stranger walks forward. He said, well, if everything you've said tonight is true, boy, do I have a creature for you to teach a lesson to. And Mike Finn is all ears. And he's like, well, tell me more about this creature. And the stranger says, well, there's this, uh, this creature that um, it has been, you know, swimming, you know, uh, around the bay and it's been going into different fishing towns and ruining the, the nets and the fishermen's boats. And uh, it's been causing a lot of hardships and, you know, boy, wouldn't it be, be nice if you rode out into the bay, the bay and uh, you taught it a lesson? Because if my calculations are correct, it should be coming past this port tonight because it's been wake, making its way, you know, um, down the south part of the bay. And you could probably go out there and, and beat it up and, and then you'd have you'd have that to be able to talk about. And Mike Finn takes the last swig of his beer and says, you know, I'm on it. And so Mike Finn goes marching out of the tavern and the whole tavern's like, oh, this is good. So the whole tavern's following him down to the dock and, uh, you know, think of those old Disney movies, you know, about the the old tiny characters who were, you know, I'm going to go teach the lesson and the whole world goes out in the town. Mike Finn's going to go out and battle a creature. So everybody shows up on the dock and Mike Finn, you know, gets into his boat and uh, sets sail for out into the bay. And he's like, I'll be back at, at dawn's early light and I'll have, you know, I'll have a tale to tell and probably the beast in my boat. So everybody's really excited. Like, like, oh, we get to be part of, you know, the story of Mike Finn. But, you know, some of the people who, who kind of question Mike Finn's accomplishments said, you know, what if Mike is is just telling another tall tale and when we go home tonight, he's just going to sail back in along one of the parts of uh, the coastline where we can't see him in one of the coves and he's going to he's going to hide out there. And then in the morning, he'll come sailing back in like he's done something. But, you know, he hasn't. So a lot of the, the people are wrong. You know, you got a good point there. So most of the town decide, well, they're going to catch Mike Finn in the act. So a quarter of the town sets up to the north of the city or the town along the lake shore. And another quarter of the town sets up on the coastline to the south, you know, about a half mile down north and south. The rest of the town is kind of, you know, keeping an eye out for any ships in the bay that, you know, might be Mike Finn and, you know, so that they can catch him if he's sneaking back in. So they're, they're all well prepared to catch Mike Finn. And the hours go by and, you know, there's some messenger people going up and down. Hey, has anybody seen anything? Nobody's seen anything yet. So by dawn's early light, everybody's like, huh, well, maybe Mike Finn, you know, maybe he did actually go out and, and encounter this creature and was actually being honest about it. So the town people start coming back into town and they're all talking and trying to decide, huh, okay, what what gives here? I, I don't know quite where Mike Finn is. Um, everybody's kind of speculating. So they all start, you know, going down to the dock and they're, they're kind of, you know, standing around Mike's boat's not there. So they're like, well, he hasn't come back in yet. Now, people at the end of the dock, um, they start seeing a small craft or a, you know, a small boat on the horizon. And, but it's just sitting there. It's not, it's not coming any, you know, closer to shoreline. It's not really doing anything. So curiosity finally gets better of some of the men. And one of the gentlemen has one of those new fancy uh, motorboats um, that gets you out into the, the water quicker. And so he and a couple other guys jump into his motorboat and they're like, we're going to go check this out. We'll, we'll be back as soon as possible. So they go out to the item. And now the people on the dock can see that the, the motorboat is approaching this other um, uh, craft that's on you know the horizon. And it's not too long before they realize, okay, here, you know, uh, they're coming back with it. Obviously they're towing this. And it's, it's a little while before they start hearing, they can hear that the men on the boats are yelling something, 
But it's not until the boats are about 50 feet away from the dock that the people on the dock can start hearing the men yelling, get a doctor, get the doctor. Somebody go find the doctor. So it's at this point that, that several of the townspeople go rushing off and, you know, trying to find the doctor, trying to, you know, see where he is. And eventually they, they do find the doctor and they're, they're just bringing the doctor back down to the pier as the men are tying up the, the motorboat onto the dock. And everybody's asking him, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's happened? And the guys in the boat say, it's Mike. And so by now the doctor's in front of the boat and the men in the boat uh, proceed to lift big Mike Finn, big strapping, girly, think, you know, uh, football player, Mike Finn. They start to lift him out of the boat and he's as white as a ghost. And everybody's like, what's wrong with him? And Mike won't answer their questions. He won't, he doesn't really do anything. He's pretty much in a catatonic state of just, uh, you know, he, he's not the Mike Finn that rode out the night before. And so the, the men, you know, uh, pick him up by, you know, arm, leg, around the body. And the doctor's like, bring him with me, bring him, bring him, bring him. And so they, they're carrying him off the deck. And a couple of Mike's friends who are just astounded at this are like, well, we need to tie up Mike's boat. So one of them jumps down as the boat to throw up the lines to the other men. And it's as he's doing this that he realizes there's something in the bottom of the boat. And as he reaches down for it and starts to pull it up, he realizes, and everybody on the dock realizes that it's this very long, slimy, black and yellow feather like from no bird that they've ever seen. And it's, it's slimy and slippery. And they're like, ooh, what kind of a feather is this? Now, the detail that the stranger from the night before left out of, you know, telling Mike Finn was that anybody who encountered Carcagna was said to go insane from its screams and if you are in its presence too long, it, it um, kind of turns you into um, uh, just, you know, a uh, zombie almost. And so it's said that on this occasion, Carcagna is the one who won the fight with Mike Finn. Now, the next creature I'm going to talk about is from Lake Superior. And he's actually one of my most favorites. But, you know, before I start talking to him, I want to, to have people who are listening, I want you to picture you're, you're in the 1700s, 1600s, and you are from you know, a Native American tribe. There are four of you, maybe five, in this long dugout canoe that's about you know, 30, 40 feet long. And the canoe is loaded down with copper and pelts and, you know, some animals that you've, you've uh, hunted and killed, um, maybe some tobacco, maybe some crops that you've picked. And so your, your canoe is very close to the water surface because dugout canoes are not very deep. Now, your shaman from your tribe and your, your chief told you, if you go out on the lake, stay close to the shoreline because the great underwater panther in a bishu won't be able to tip you and drown you if you're close to shore. You'll be able to, you know, get up on shore and then walk back. It'll be a long process, but at least you'll be alive. And so you're you're rowing along, you know, the lake shore um, in deep enough water so that you know you're not um, getting stuck. And as you come around a bend in the water. Suddenly, the water surface starts to boil, and out of this water erupts in a bishu. And he has this huge rack of horns on his head, and this uh, long snout and muzzle, and his, his blackish brown fur is covered with seaweed and algae. So he almost has a green appearance and, and the, the fur looks spiky and he has seaweed for a mane. And 
he's not very happy to see you in the canoe there. So he's striking out at you with his front, you know, uh, legs and he's trying to tip your canoe. So you guys are rowing as hard as you can to get away from him. You don't even want to look back because you're in so fear of this creature, this underwater panther, um, this monster that, you know, can uh, take down ships of any size. And so you go one way and you're hoping Anabishu will go another way. You're hoping that, you know, he's had his, his, fun with you and that's it. So here's a fact that I learned when I was researching my book, Lake Monsters and Other Water, Underwater Creatures of the Great Lakes. And that's the fact that moose, adult moose, can seal their nostrils shut and dive up to 20 feet underwater to eat seaweed and other, other, other underwater um, plants. So if there's been no crops that summer, if it's been a rainy, you know, summer and nothing's really grown, if it's been a very dry summer and nothing's really grown, the moose know that they can wade out into the water and dive underneath the water surface and eat as much of this yummy, uh, nutritious uh, plant matter as they want. And they don't really have to go hungry on land looking for, you know, their food that possibly never got a chance to grow. So this takes us into the legend of Inabishu, the great underwater panther or horned uh, serpent of Lake Superior. Now Inabishu is said to be the mortal enemy of uh, any thunderbird in the territory and that the thunderbird's job is to hold Inabishu, the underwater panther in check but every once in a while, the Thunderbird gets distracted, and it's when he releases his, his attention that Anabishu is able to thrash around and create these huge storms on Lake Superior. And it's said that he is also the guardian of the underworld. And a lot of Native American legends talk about deep water being uh, the gates to the next realm, the underworld. So Inabishu, the great underwater panther, who is described as having a huge rack of horns on his head, a horse or moose-like head, spiky hair and seaweed for a mane, sometimes has wings, um, sometimes doesn't, depends on if it's male or female, if it's young or old. Um, a long spiky tail and, you know, four legs that it can smash a ship with and back legs that can propel it through the water so fast that no ship can escape it. So that is um, my final amalgamation to talk about in a Bishu. He's one of my favorites. Um, now, if you're going to look him up, I would first Google underwater panther. Um, because in Ibishu, or the name of the underwater panther, depending on what Native American tribe you are talking to, there are over 50 different spellings and enunciations of in Ibishu's name. I pronounce it in Ibishu because that is the easiest for me to pronounce. Some people uh, pronounce it uh, Mishibishu, um, but to me, that sounds too much like the car. So I will go with Inabishu. And um, like I said, he's one of my favorites um, of all the lake monsters. Um, certainly, there has been many legends attributed to him. Now, my final category that I'm going to talk about is merfolk or merman. Now, ladies, I want you to calm down because I'm not talking about Jason the Moa Aquaman. No, this creature looks nothing like that. Um, not even close. So the creature that we are going to be talking about is the great god of the water, the Manitou Nibinibis. Now it said that Nibinibis looks like a small brown skinned child. He has a bit of a fuzz to his skin. And he does have more hair on his back and on the top of his head. But it's said that he's half human, half fish. And that occasionally he will um, sit upright in the waves, observing the land. And, you know, kind of watches, you know, what's going on in the lakes. Now, our story about 
uh, Manitou Nibba Nibbis, comes from Pai Island, which is up in uh, northwestern Lake Superior. It's over by the uh, Minnesota side. And on this occasion, there was French fur traders who had been going around Lake Superior, setting up different trading posts with Native Americans and with settlers, um, hoping to get their trade route you know, established so that they could do some trading. And it said that they had been making their way across the lake. They came upon this body of land with Pie Island. And they thought, you know, this is a good spot to rest because they really didn't know how close they were to the other side of the lake. So they start hauling their canoes ashore and the canoes are loaded down with pelts, with tobacco, with copper, um, and also their living supplies, everything that they need to make this journey. Um, because in this day and age, it's not like there's a 7-Eleven or a Myers or a Walmarts, um, you know, every 10 miles, uh, there's nothing. Uh, you're lucky if you come up a homestead that might have, you know, a house and, and a barn on it. Um, this is very, very uh, late 1700s. So with them was a Native American squaw, and she was their communicator for um, the translations and negotiating with the different tribes. So they they are on shore, they're hauling their canoes up on, on to the land, and the beach. And at this point, one of the men looks out in the water and sees what he thinks is a child swimming in the water. And he's just perplexed. Who on earth would let their child swim alone out in these crazy waters that are filled with monsters? And he gets everyone's attention. He's pointing and everybody's like, oh, what's that child doing out? And then they're like, I don't think that's a child. Uh, that's a beaver. That's a huge beaver. Oh my God, we could get we could get huge money for that pelt. Now it's at this point that the Native American squaw realizes what they're talking about. And she's like, uh, that's neither. It's not a child and it's not a beaver. And they're like, no, no, it's a beaver. We've seen beaver, that's a beaver. So they start getting their guns for like, we're gonna shoot it, we're gonna get it, and we're gonna skin it. And she's like, oh no, you're not. She's like, that is not what you think it is. That is the God of the water. That is the great Manitou Nibbidibus. And it's at this point that the creature realizes that they've seen it and it raises its hand up from the water and it waves at them and then disappears underneath the wave. And the men are like, ah, oh, man, we, list, we missed an opportunity for a new felt. And she's like, oh no, no, we need to get as fast into the middle of the island as we can because now that we've seen it and it has seen us, it's going to send the worst storm that you will ever remember in your life. And the men are like, okay, whatever. She's like, okay, I, you know, I can build a shelter myself. Bye guys. If you're here, you know, after the storm, congratulations. So she starts making her way into the middle of the island. She starts building a shelter, one that she's hoping will withstand the storm that's coming. And eventually the men are like, you know, maybe she's right. So they finish hauling in their canoes up onto the land and fastening them to the trees and the rocks there. They do eventually find her and they help her finish up a shelter. And it's just about this time that, you know, they're thinking maybe we should get a fire started that the dark storm clouds start coming in. And she's like, see, I told you. And it said that for the next three days and three nights, the sky opens up and the rain is like nothing any of the men have ever seen before. It's coming down, down so hard that they can't even see outside of the shelter. Um, and they're barely staying dry and warm inside the shelter because the rain is just battering it down. And it said that after the three days pass, all of the men decide that if they ever see what they think is a child or a beaver swimming in the lakes by itself, they will leave well enough alone because they don't want to try to deal with a storm like that again. And the Native American squaw tells them that's probably a good idea because next time the great Manitou Nibinibis is not going to go away empty handed. So with that, I will open it up for any questions that anybody has, and uh, hopefully I can answer your questions. 
All right, great. Um, we did get a uh, couple of questions here. And if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to leave them in the chat and I will go ahead and ask them. But uh, firstly, uh, we have a question here that is, uh, so with the improvement in technology, uh, has anyone been fortunate enough to catch a view of one of these creatures on some sort of image or recording? So there, there are a few different videos and pictures out there. Um, the hard part of anything that's underwater is you're not going to get a clear look at it. And with our Great Lakes being as big and as deep and as wide as they are, really, it's like um, you really have to be in the right place at the right time in order to, you know, see them. And so um, as far as I know, there, you know, there are a couple of, of pictures, videos out there, but they don't really show um, to any effect, you know, what the creature is. Um, and even in a land, you know, in our landlocked lakes, um, like uh, Lake Superior, like uh, Michigan, like Huron, those are still huge bodies of water. And um, I always like to add this fact, um, Lake Superior or Lake Erie is our uh, shallowest body of water. And there was a ship called the Bessemer Marquette Number no. 2, a ship about the length of a football field and made out of metal. It went missing in modern times in like the 1970s, 1960s in Lake Erie, and it still has not, not been found to this day. So if a ship of that size can go missing and, you know, is resting on the lake bottom somewhere, um, certainly a free moving creature can go anywhere in the lakes that it wants and it can avoid uh, boats and humans um, if it wants to. Excellent. Uh and uh, I'm curious, do we know if any of these accounts, because there are so many stories and so varied, hey, do we know if like there were any accounts coming from the Great Lakes of something which maybe was led to the discovery of an, uh, like some kind of animal species or creature that we hadn't known of before? So, yes, actually we do. And it is, um, this would fall in the giant fish category, but there is a creature, a placoderm fish called the um, Dunkelosteus. And its fossil remains were actually found in a quarry in Cleveland that at one point had been underwater, um, you know, from Lake Erie. So we do know that this fish species was actually swimming in the Great Lakes area at one time. Now, these fish were about 20 feet long, about you know, two tons, and were basically the armor-plated um, tanks of the fish world. Um, they were bigger than any sharks at that time period and pretty much could eat whatever they wanted. Um, so yes, we do have um, that fossil remain, but it's really hard with the Great Lakes, um, the areas of the Great Lakes that are still underwater because at no point in our lifetime will they be drained for us to find fossil remains. And even if we did have really superior technology, we have a problem called the zebra mussels and when they die and start to deteriorate, they become like a tissue paper type consistency. So almost every one of the Great Lakes, the bottom um, two feet of the water above the lake bed is this debris of zebra mussels and it, it just looks like shredded toilet paper. Um, and it's covering up all the wrecks, um, shipwrecks, um, you know, rock formations down there. It's, it's really become quite a um, detriment to the Great Lakes uh, for any type of um, surveying. And that, that's interesting. And uh, it's interesting how these are kind of like overlapping problems of like this ongoing ecological problem. But uh, it, it also makes it difficult to find some of these things that may may have been hinted at or we have like yeah. speculations about. So that's 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 an interesting kind of uh, entwining of these problems. And actually, it's funny that uh, the, the Dunkleosteus that I loved that <laughs> that uh, animals when I was a kid, I, I, I saw art of it and I thought it was so uh -huh cool and it had like the teeth come like the jaws that kind of just turn into the teeth yes. it just, it's so like scary and cool so that's I'm really glad I got to learn about that um and and I I know that um we didn't 
uh, we, we weren't really able to um, facilitate any uh, pictures or anything tonight just due to the, the technical difficulties of making that happen. But um, I'm curious, in any of your books uh, or anything like that, do you have, because uh, we had a question about illustrations tonight or like okay. if there are any pictures, in any of your books, do you have any like illustrations yes. or so, like visual? So in my book, Lake, uh, Lake Monsters and Odd Creatures of the Great Lakes, um, I'm a do-it-yourself person, so almost all of the um, photography and illustrations are from me. So um, the amalgamations, of course, they're, those are drawings and artwork that I did. And um, so those are all in my book on Lake Monsters. And there's, there's pictures from the different museums that I've gone to. And uh, there's actually one from um, being able to go uh, shark diving and getting a picture of a bull shark. So um, uh, those are all in the book. Um, and uh, the book is, um, you can get it on Amazon. You can either get the black and white version or you can get the full color version. Um, full color version is more expensive because uh, it takes more ink, but yeah, there's there's lots of pictures in there. But the Dunk Colosseus is a quite popular um, fossil and there is one on display in um, Ann Arbor at the Natural History Museum. I think in Cranbrook um, Science Museum possibly has one. I know they have a T-Rex. I think they might possibly have the Dunkleosius skull too, but I know that the museum um, in Ann Arbor, the Natural History Museum there definitely has a Dunkleosius skull. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe one day I'll be fortunate enough to check that out. Um, uh, we got another uh, question here and it's uh, they ask, uh, is it, possible that uh these creatures came along with ships that traveled from larger seaways and uh, i think i would add uh on top of that um what might be some common sort of like theories or reasons we might see uh these uh, unusual creatures so um most of the time you know like i said it it, it is a a being in the right place at a right time type scenario with seeing them. But most of the creatures that are here um, in the Great Lakes, um, I wouldn't say that they came over with large ships. Um, you know, that certainly is true for the zebra mussels and the sea lampreys because they can attach the ships. A plesiosaur or something like that isn't exactly going to suction cup through the side of a ship. Um, and plus going through the the locks and the, the canals themselves, there's not really that much room in between, you know, the bottom of the ship and the bottom of the canal and the sides of the canal. So you really, you're in, and, and, you know, they are very um, um, restrictive on, you know, how much, you know, room they let the ship, you know, go in before closing the gate and stuff like that. So it's not like there's really a chance for anything like that. So anything that is in the Great Lakes had to be here from prehistoric times and as the lakes started forming from glaciers, carving them out and like the Western Interior Sea had um, some channels that, you know, did come up into the Great Lakes areas. Um, also like the Mississippi River fed into um, the, it, it goes from like Lake Michigan down into the Gulf of Mexico. It is possible that before the 1950s, creatures would have been able to swim up through those waterways and the same with the St. Lawrence uh, waterway um, and get into the Great Lakes. But after the 1950s, they installed these locks and dams in order to control the silver carp populations so that they wouldn't get into the Great Lakes and decimate the um, sports fishing industry with the salmon, the bass and the trout. All right, that's interesting. And I, again, it's like, more of these kind of connections with like things that are affecting the lakes at large and uh, their ecosystems and our understandings of creatures like that. Um, I, I think uh, we don't have any other uh, viewer questions. So I think I'll uh, throw in a last question here okay. out of personal curiosity. Um, so when you begin the process of writing about these creatures and, and more importantly, I think like researching them, uh, is it something more of a process where you hear a story first or is the process kind of like where you, you hear about a creature and you start looking for, you know, like where are these stories coming from? Who has information on it? 
Mm -hmm. So um, I do take a lot of eyewitness reports um, because I, I research as a whole cryptozoology and the paranormal. So um, I'm always being contacted about, um, you know, from people who have had experiences, but I also like to look into the historical reports because um, before the time of P.T. Barnum, before the, you know, the time of people realizing that there was money to be made, if you had an oddity or there was something unusual and you could offer it as an attraction and sell 25 cents, 50 cents for it, uh, for people to look at it, um, before that time, people really didn't want to like report anything like that. And generally, if they were making a report, if you know, about a monster, it was because they were in fear for their families, their, their community, um, you know, their livestock, and hoping that, you know, the whole town would come together with whatever weapons they had in order to disband the creature. Um, and the same applies, whether it's, you know, water, land, or air, um, you know, people didn't want to be called crazy. So therefore, unless this creature was causing a lot of chaos, People generally tended to be quiet about it, but once, you know, some sheep or something like that start going missing, then people start to, you know, hey, I think we have a, you know, we, it's more than just a, a you know, natural predator and we've seen this and we found that. And so historical reports give us quite a bit to work from and also the fossil record. Um, I always like to begin my investigations in the fossil record and see what natural occurring species um, might this pertain to, or, you know, could have been, um, you know, attributed to. Excellent. Yeah. And I think that's really, really interesting how that's kind of developed over the years. So this is a really interesting look at a lot of these topics. And uh, I would like to take this time to uh, thank everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you all for watching this real, you know, fun program, getting to learn a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, of course, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Shitan Noir, uh, thank you very much for uh, being here You're tonight. Uh, if you, you have any fighting, if you have any parting words you'd like to share, please go ahead and do so. Well, hey, if anybody out there, um, if you are going to go looking for creatures or uh, want to invest the paranormal or cryptozoology, um, my books are a good start for information. Um, I put a lot of information into the magazines for Squatch. GQ and Squatch Digest. And you can find uh, me on Facebook and on Amazon, um, Shatan, S-H-E-T-A-N, Noir, N-O-I-R. And uh, I'm always looking for information. And if I have information uh, or answers for your questions, I uh, will certainly try to get that information to you. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And with that, I will say good night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.